Is that better? Mm -hmm. A little faster? I think we're gonna, I just, I just was told after I contacted the IT department and the College of Educational Technology that you can actually use UV Learns. Actually, someone from another college told me that. They didn't know. But anyways, hopefully that went a little more smoothly than before. So we'll continue doing this with A through M and N through Z. Although it seems like there's more people with N through Z because that line was longer. So, welcome to another evening of the Fall 20, 2022 Department of Art Speaker Series. So we'll take this off so you can hear me better. And I'm very excited to have with us tonight another amazing artist, Robert Lee Bell, who lived in Buffalo for a little while, but no more. Um, and I'm also very excited that our sculpture professor, Reinhard Rosenstein, is going to introduce Robert Lee. Some of you um, might have been in Professor Reinhardt's classes, um, but if not, he's a well-known sculptor who's been working in the field for too long, too long, 40 years or so, <laughs> making large um, public artworks. Uh, more recently, uh, working with ecological environmental uh, ideas. So he's going to introduce Robert Lee, and they've known each other for some time. And then uh, Robert Lee will come up and show her amazing work. So let's please welcome Professor Reinhardt Reinhardt. Keep it brief. That's too long. I'm going to read that. It's too long. <laughs> Hey guys, good evening, thanks for showing up on, on Monday. I know it's uh, always a challenge. Apparently Robert Lee said this is too long that I'm gonna read about her, okay, so, but I'm gonna read it anyway, Robert Lee, so you know, know that you're not short on words, so we'll do this together. Uh, we started to hang out together during the, um, the first iterations of Playground. Um, that We'll have a, another iteration opening up this weekend down at, uh, down at the Harbor area. If you're aware of that, uh, hopefully you guys can get down for the opening on Saturday. Um, they seem to change venues every time. When, when uh, Robert Lee and I got to know each other, they were in Medina, New, we were in Don, Medina, New York, in the old high school there, which was an amazing sight. It was really quite incredible. So, And, you know, um, sites change every year, so everything's good. And Robert Lee has changed sites as well. Was, was, what, left Buffalo, what, two years? Three years now? Three. Three years now, yeah, there you go. And now living on the East Coast. So, let's start. Uh, Robert E. Bell is inspired by nature and time. Her practice draws on the world around her, in particular the scrutiny of nature and the built environment. Alongside her sculptural practice, Bell has developed a practice of walking, moving outside the studio to investigate place in real time. Bell is the recipient of numerous fellowships, including awards from New York Foundation of the Arts, a Paula Krasner Fellowship, that's like serious, really hard to get, that right. And the senior scholar Fulbright Turkey, in Turkey, she, um, her book, Do You Know This Tree, published by Visual Studies Workshop Rochester, uh, New York, is the accumulation of a 10-year walking project in Istanbul. So she spent a great deal of time in that beautiful part of the world. Most recently, she was a research fellow in the Department of Urban Planning at Malmo University in Sweden. Bell has had uh, numerous residencies, including the Cité Internationale in Paris, Stadtkünstlerhaus in, in Salzburg, Austria, the International Studio Program in New York City, and the Sculpture Space in Utica, New York, amongst others. Bell's work has been exhibited and reviewed internationally, including Istanbul, Turkey, Kaliningrad, Russia, Chicago, that's a contentious place now, right? Russia, Chicago, Pittsburgh, Cambridge, and Cleveland. Her upcoming exhibition, Making the Marks, Sculpture and Drawing opens at the Battleboro Museum of Art in June 2023. So Bell maintains a studio in the historic canal city of Holyoke, Maine. Massachusetts. In Massachusetts. Holyoke, that's it. Holyoke, Massachusetts. The other one's not in Maine. Yeah. There you go. I always get the MAs mixed up myself. Anyway, probably Bell, it's fantastic that you're here. And I think you're going to love it to see you guys. Thank you, my friend. <laughs> Hi. Um, let's see. Can you hear me? Yeah. All right. We're good. Thank you. Um, it is a pleasure to be here. 
and it is a pleasure to be talking to students. And so I hope that there's some uh, insight that comes to. I'm not doing so good. Is that good? Yeah, if we leave in a little, that's better. Okay. That's better. Now we're on. All right. This is the view from my window, and I, um, my window in Massachusetts. Uh, and the view out my window is really important to me. Wherever I am, um, th this idea of starting my day by framing the world around me. And I think about how that seeps into a way of thinking and making in my studio practice. Uh, I am primarily a sculptor. Um, and I'm going to speak this evening about uh, several projects that have taken place over a number of decades. Um, and also a number of, of modes of production. So I am primarily a sculptor, but I also work in the public realm. I've uh, produced artist books. I've worked in some photo documentary projects. Uh, and as Reinhardt mentioned, I also have a practice outside of the studio of walking. Um, so I'm going to kind of touch on a lot of these things. And for many of you, it might seem like really uh, disparate and diverse ways of working, but there are threads that pull this work together, some of them much more obvious than others. Uh, this project, The Shape of the Afternoon, uh, was an installation at the Decor of a Museum outside of Boston. And it was a project that had a very large exterior gallery space that was attached to an interior gallery space that was the transition point. So for me, the biggest concern about the exhibition was how to make that transition from the inside to the outside. It, the outside space, though, I have, I have to say, is that my use of bold color really was able to hold its own against this magnificent landscape that surrounded it. And so that, that was a, um, a little bit of a challenge where the landscape changed over the season and that the work was up for six months' time. And so the trees that you saw in the background, at one point, they were leafed out. Uh, but I was really concerned about how uh, the audience was going to move from this inside space to the outside and that there was this connection. And what I did is I, I um, got this really great shag, green shag carpet I, and covered the interior gallery with the, the carpet. Then there was a series of small pieces, which I refer to as still lifes, um, mounted on the wall. And this one piece that went from the interior to the exterior, and it literally pulled through the wall, uh, this, this one sculpture from the inside to the outside. And I have to kind of give a nod to uh, Frank Lloyd Wright to be appropriate here. And Falling Water really gave me that idea of how I could kind of utilize that. And that kind of goes back to I haven't gotten very far, have I? Um, kind of goes back to this thing of looking out the window, right? Like, like the world seeps in around you when you're thinking about something. And while I was working on this project is when I went on a trip to Falling Water. And I'm quite familiar with the architecture of Frank Lloyd Wright. And I had been to Falling Water before. But there's, there's one room where literally the, the floor pulls to the outside, or you could say the, in, the outside pulls to the inside. And I realized straight away when I walked into that room, oh, that, that solves my problem uh, on this uh, installation that I was working on. Uh, this is probably the shortest lived exhibition. Uh, it opened in <laughs> at March of 2020, four days before the governor of Massachusetts closed down the state. Uh, though it stayed in the gallery for almost seven months before it got packed up. And, and this is a series of vertically oriented sculptors, sculptures, which become a little bit different than, than the ones that I just showed you, in that early on I would say that, that the work um, was really very much uh, coming from uh, the tradition of organic abstraction and kind of moving that into the 21st century with a hybridized organic form, where these vertical pieces uh, become, become different in the way in which they're composed in, in the stacking of these really diverse elements in terms of the materials that are being used, but also the, the structure of individual forms that are being stacked. And there's lots of visual references here from, you know, 
Brancusi to Noguchi to you know possibly the um, iconic American skyscraper, right? And this idea of the verticality. It's really important to me in thinking about these vertical sculptures in, in the way that we might look at a, a Brancusi or a Noguchi that the sculpture is not starting at the top or at the bottom. It is, it is the whole, right? So it, it's really the whole before the parts. And that, that's a complicated way in working with, with these stackings. And, and I do think about the pieces often being, um, I think the best way to describe it is being transitory until they're not. And what I mean by that is that um, it, it really takes a long time to to fix the piece in space, to know that, that say, the piece on the right should be situated on this table, um, or vice versa. I, I could move them around. But then once it's fixed, that is the piece. But for me, and I think for all of you over time, um, is it is about time. It, it really is giving the work uh, enough time to be, be certain. Right? So it, for a lot of people, they can look at, at the, the sculptures that I make, and they, they might appear that they could happen quite quickly. But there's really a slow process, not just in modeling the form, but in coming to this decision about wh what is that final piece, and giving the, the, the work the time that it needs to bring it to fruition. Uh, color is obviously pretty <laughs> important to me. And color has become increasingly important as the works become more white. You know, early on it was like everything was a color. Um, and over time, the whiteness has started to dominate forms and the color becomes a highlight or a focal point. So color is really uh, critical, right? Like we know that color is, is a guaranteed way to get a reaction. Um, but color is also something that is random. It, it, it's, in, it's intuitive. It's the last step, last process that happens in the making of a work. I don't pre-plan pre what, what color might be um, for a piece. And so it's really about uh, observations that I make in the world and, and, and notes that I keep. And, and this piece, on this yellow block has this really lovely story. Um, the piece is called Between Nothing, and for a very long time, and that means well over a year, it existed on this uh, bright yellow uh, plank on the wall, uh, but it was all white. And, and then there was this little bit of turquoise, and then it still, you know, it just wasn't, it, it wasn't there yet. And so I was in Cleveland. I was talking to somebody here today who was, comes from Cleveland. I was in Cleveland at, at the uh, museum, and I was standing in line for a coffee. And the woman in front of me had this really, really nice floral skirt on that was yellow with turquoise. It's nice. But she had on hot pink flats. So I took out my notebook, and I wrote that down. And I went back to the studio, and I resolved this piece. Uh, so you know, it, it's really like we're walking around with an idea, and the world is filled with solutions. But you need to be walking around with the idea and open to the solution that's out there. So you really have to be attentive and observant, or I do, to solve my own problems. Uh, I began a series of sculptures that I refer to as some things. And they're, they're intimately scaled. They're maybe between 8 and 15 inches high. They still are made from a diverse range of materials. And they're very much about texture and, and color um, in this in inventiveness of form. When I began them, I, I thought of them as preliminary studies for large scale sculptures. Uh, but over time, this series has continued and become a significant body of work in its own. Uh, and and the some things are, are really kind of an important way of working for me. And in the obvious, I guess, that they're smaller. And so 
there is the possibility of working faster, yet they still take that same amount of time to, to settle. To, to gel, to be fixed, that I know that this piece is, is correct. And um, the one with the red wood leg is um, called Listening to Opera. And that piece of wood was many different colors before it came, became red. And so there, there's an intuitive sense of learning for yourself uh, what might be the, the right solution. Uh, for a particular piece. And I don't start out knowing that. Uh, I, I come to it over time. And, and I really allow myself to take the time that is needed for a work to come to fruition. Uh, so drawing is, is my tool. Drawing is what gets me somewhere. Because I'm working with this language of abstraction. I'm inventing forms that don't already exist. So they have to come from somewhere. Uh, so I start on paper. Uh, I start by drawing. Drawing for me is a way of thinking out loud. Um, it is always my critical beginning. I am not thinking about creating a finished drawing. Um, I'm not thinking about the drawing as the outcome. The drawing is my tool. It is a way to get an idea to get a gesture, and then I refine it in space because I, I'm, I'm thinking about sculpture. I'm thinking about working in, in real space. And so that's where I'm going to refine it. Uh, often what I do is I go back and forth on the same drawing. So some pieces might have 10 drawings because there's been so many changes, and others might just have one because I'll start the drawing always working in a very fluid material, um, soft charcoal or watercolor pencil, as I say, because I don't want to refine it in paper. I want to refine it in space. Uh, but then if the form really kind of begins to exist in space very much as, as it is on paper, then I can just go back and continue to work on the same drawing. And I don't have to start another drawing. Uh, I'm only starting another drawing of a piece if if things are changing and I can't keep wiping it out. Uh, but as I say, the drawing is really this way to, to work through what, what are your possibilities? What, what are your plausibilities in, in the making of any piece? And I have had a lot of people say to me, oh, you should keep all, all of the marks, all of the drawings, you know, to kind of be this record. But the record for me is, is the piece as, as it exists in space. That, that's the thing that's important. But I wouldn't get there without my process of drawing. Um, and, and I really, I, I want to I kind of stress that because I think that um, it, it's really easy to want to get to the end result quickly, to just work in what you think is the final product and not have to do the preliminary steps. And that, that's dangerous. Um, or I think it's dangerous, because you eliminate too much that could happen. So I go back and forth with drawing, and uh, drawing is obviously critical to when I'm working on uh, large-scale pieces in the public realm. And when I work on a large-scale piece uh, for public sculpture, I begin with a gestural drawing. And it might remain that way for several months before it becomes a CAD rendering. I never begin with a CAD rendering. And the reason that I do not begin with a CAD rendering is that I feel, um, I, I feel that the, the CAD drawing for me and the type of work that I make removes it from the possibility of the kind of uniqueness of the organic form that it could have. And so I've really developed a way of translating a hand gesture that I had made in charcoal into a CAD program so that I'm able to, to manipulate the forms in a computer-aided drawing process that is not quite so rigid as it would be if I started directly in the computer-aided drawing, in the CAD drawing. 
And I, I've worked in the public realm for a number of decades. And since my earliest piece, and this is the very first permanent piece that I did, it's in Cambridge, Massachusetts, um, I've had a lingering concern. And it is the question of where is the public in public art? Uh, and not all public artists work in the same way. Um, it is a question that, that uh, concerns me and that I want to be involved in making uh, works in the public realm that are more than, than the object to be looked at. I, I want it to be um, the object with meaning. Uh, and, and the meaning is not necessarily about function, but an object with meaning that has some relationship to the stakeholders. So I have developed a, as part of my public art practice that I do um, community design conversations to really figure out what is it that the community, the stakeholders <coughs> want. So in Cambridge, what we ended up with was a gate system that divided the community garden and the park. Because in Cambridge, as in many cities, a, a community garden is a, is a random plots uh, lottery system. So you could live anywhere in Cambridge. But if it's your park, you live right around it. You live close by. So the two groups really wanted something that, that, was, that marcated those two areas. So I created a topiary st structure that is both a sculpture um, used for growing beans and it's a gate. But it divided those two areas. And I fast forward to a recently uh, completed piece at the University of Massachusetts that was also in a, a transitory space or a, a, a space that had two, was the boundary between the University of Massachusetts and the town of Amherst. And all along what would be considered the boundary uh, are very leftover green spaces, like what's left over after all the parking lots. Yet there was this one area that was very odd, a very odd shape, but it held within it a collection of really important specimen trees that had just been so overlooked for decades. Um, there's a, a magnificent blue cedar and a Lebanese cedar there. And so I, I really wanted to pay, have people pay attention to those. So I created uh, this series of urn uh, benches, which ha had lo lots of ways of interpreting them, the urn being iconic for pastoral landscapes. So I have it kind of playfully on its side, but really wanting to get people to come in off the sidewalk to kind of sit amongst these trees uh, and to perhaps see the area in a way that they had not seen it before. So to have that experience. But when you're working in the public realm, it, it's a really different client than working in your studio because you, you have a client. It's the public. And so it, it's, it's quite a different way of, of approaching the process of thinking about the work. But Temporary public projects are what really allow me, anyways, to engage with uh, the public. But in creating temporary participatory projects, you really run the risk. If somebody doesn't want, if your audience doesn't want to participate, then you, you don't get some, uh, something rendered from an action, which is what I need in, in the projects that I've done. In 2010, I was a part of the University Night, uh, the European Night of the Museums held in Kaliningrad, Russia. Um, and there's not really a time for the uh, history lesson of Kaliningrad, but at the end of World War II, it was not Russia, it was Konigsberg. And it was uh, soon after the end of World War II that it uh, had to become a part of Russia. Um, there are two buildings that weren't bombed this uh, medieval tower and Kant's, uh, the cathedral where Kant is buried. Uh, so for the European Knights of the Museum, the proposal was quite simple. And I think it was probably some sophistication was probably lost in translation from Russian into the English. Uh, but it, but it, the simplicity makes it all that more important. It was to make human the tower. My proposal was to adorn the tower with flowers and 
uh, the European Night of the Museums is a 24 hour uh, activity, performative activity. So we gave away the flowers. And uh, in the process of doing that, it, it, language is an issue, right? So I created a, a pictogram that kind of showed that you took the flower home, you nurtured that flower, and then you documented for us, for the museum staff, where is home? Uh, and it was incredibly successful. Uh, and again, it's like you don't really know like what, what's going to happen from this, right? And it was, it was extraordinary. Um, the amount of people that responded uh, either with a photograph or with written letters. And it, it was really, um, I was surprised the museum staff in Kaliningrad was extremely surprised by it. And then I was invited to redo this project at the Istanbul Biennial, the 11th Istanbul Biennial. Uh, but there was a problem for me in that I realized it would be reaching only an art audience. So I needed to rethink how does the, the project go out into the public, into a wider audience, as it did in Kaliningrad. So what we did, um, is we gave the flowers away to those who came to the biennial venue and then asked them to re-gift it somewhere in the city. And the project was uh, organized by uh, a social activist group called Mind the Gap. Uh, they're out of the UK and it was under this auspices called Desk Project. So there were a few of us in this space with these desks. So every day, um, 12 flowers were put back on my desk until they were all taken. And then the next day, 12 more. And they would be given and, and spread out through the city. So it really kind of became this catalyst of, of a way of creating this network out into the city of, of Istanbul. Again, it's like you're asking for the audience to participate and you really don't know what those results are going to be. So there's a risk because in these projects, without the willingness of the audience, I, I don't actually have a, a project. Uh, 2021, I was invited to a land trust to create a project and it was really very exciting for me because I had thought about this particular project for quite some time. Stories about a tree. It's called I Remember a Tree. And so I was really, really excited that I could go there to build this project. And as I say, you're asking for participation, but this is summer 2021, and we think we're kind of maybe, possibly coming out of the pandemic. So it's again, what's this challenge? Like, it, are we going to have participation or not? And um, it turned out to be pretty extraordinary. But I, I want to say something about working in the public realm. It's not just that you have this client and that you have to think about um, uh, lots of other, lots of things that you do not have to think about working in your studio for, for a gallery exhibition. But um, uh, for me to work in the public realm with the people that I'm actually working on the ground with, I have to feel that there's, there's respect and trust. And, this project was, was put out there by, by a curator and the director of the land trust was really, truly excited, really enthusiastic about the project in a way that really kind of surprised me. I'm not sure why, but it did. But his crew was not at all. Like, they didn't want any part of it. And here's the reason they didn't want any part of it. I wanted to cite this piece in this magnificent meadow and this magnificent meadow is 100% constructed nature that takes an enormous amount of effort to maintain. But when I got there and started talking to the crew and they realized that I understood what a meadow was and how in fact we construct the meadow and the meadow just doesn't exist in such a way that that we, we started to be able to develop um, a really nice working relationship where they really became engaged in the project. 
And so there's this blue tree inside a chain link house. And um, I ask you to write a story about a tree that you remember. This tree in your life, it is a landmark. But it's serving as a landmark for a memory. It's not really so much about the tree. It's about this thing that circles around the tree, this activity, this event, somebody else. Right? So yes, it's about the tree, and it's about our desire for nature and how we hold that so close. But the stories become memories. That yes, I remember a tree, but I remember this thing that, it, that happened near the tree, or with the tree, or with other people. Uh, and the stories came from children, from adults, from all ages. And over the course of a summer, we had hundreds and hundreds of stories. And it was really pretty, pretty special. Um, and so I do this walking practice. Uh, and it's been going on for a while, and I don't exactly know how it really started. Um, but I, I'm interested in, in sensory observation and back to my window and looking at the world and how things seep in and my way of finding that color at the coffee shop. Um, I, I'm interested in being out there in the world. And so I have developed a practice of, um, of walking and um, these projects sometimes begin with a strategy, with a plan, and sometimes they just kind of begin. Um, and I don't always know where the project is going to go. Uh, sometimes it's a book, sometimes it's photo documentation. Um, there's a walk that was in Sharjah uh, that's actually a letter. That was the results of it. So they, they, the, those things come, they come to me and then end up in, in different forms. And this is a walk that's not finished. I, I began in Paris uh, at a residency at the Cité International in January 2020, um, which abruptly came to an end. And we all know what happened after that, um, the pandemic. And so I kind of just like don't exactly know where this a point to a line is going to go. It, it's, it's a juxtaposition between walking on the canals in Holyoke, where my studio is in Massachusetts, um, and walks in Paris along the Seine, and how the edge of the water and the land form the shapes of those walks. So it, it's going to come to resolution. But there's a really beautiful thing about work that isn't finished. Unfinished work kind of lingers in this space, this realm of possibilities. Because we don't exactly know what that finished form is going to be yet. So I never think about a project that being unfinished as being um, something bad, something negative. It, it, it lingers, and that's OK. And it'll take, it takes the time that it needs to take. But knowing that it's unfinished, it, ha it has the possibility of going in so many directions that might not have been the direction I had thought of when I began the project, um, when I planned it. Which, th this is my, the first walk that became, became a book. It's called A Borrowed View. And in 2007, I was at, um, the, in Salzburg at the Kunstler House. And, and the project that I wrote for the residency to go to the Kunstler House was based on two historic gardens in Salzburg, uh, Mirabel and Helburn. And I wanted to go to Salzburg and to use these gardens as points of departure to photograph constructed nature just opposed against appropriated nature, um, something man-made that is, is uh, natural or appearing natural. Uh, and it was about the walking. It was about the time as the distance between places that became critical to me. So it's the line, right? For me, it's the line. That's the path that takes me from the Kunstlerhaus, which is the open space, to the green marks are uh, constructed nature, and the blue circles are uh, the appropriated nature. So 
the marking of that on a line is all that's really relevant because the other thing that is needed is just the time markation that I have on the photograph. And that, that, that's the only landmark information that we need on the kinds of maps that, that I'm interested in making. Um, <coughs> I think most of the people in this room uh, weren't here uh, in 2017. <laughs> A few were. Um, I uh, lived in Istanbul, and um, these are my trees. I, I really think of them as my trees. So in 2010, I lived in Istanbul. And I was there on a Fulbright, and I was working on a very specific urban planning project. But I found myself photographing these trees. Um, these trees that are kind of, well, they're, they're in inconvenient places. They're, they're kind of ugly. Um, I, was, I did go by the day that this little pomegranate tree was run over, and then I saw the men from the mosque come out and bandage it. And, but I found myself photographing these trees. And one of my colleagues from the university saw the photographs hanging in my apartment. And he said to me, what are you photographing these trees for? They're, s they're so ugly. And I said, well, I really find them interesting. And, and then I said, because he reminded me that I said this, I said, the trees represent the humanity of Istanbul. It's a very busy, very crowded city. Um, and, and so the trees really lingered with me, but then I came home and I put the trees away and I went on to whatever else it was doing once I returned back to the United States and I didn't think about the trees again. On the 27th of May in 2013, in the city of Istanbul began the demonstrations in Geze Park. The demonstrations in Geze Park were at first dem uh, demonstrations to save the trees of the park uh, because the government was going to bulldoze it and make a mall. Uh, there's a song about that, you know, make a shopping mall. But uh, it really wasn't about the trees, right? It was, it was a political um, demonstration that kind of, over the course of the weeks and months that followed, took over um, the country of, of Turkey in, in quite a, a violent way. But, um, in 2015, I, I decided that I was going to try to go back to Istanbul to find my trees. And these are trees that I had never intended to see again. I mean, it wasn't an intention, so I didn't know exactly where they were. You know, it might be on the way to a friend's house, or a way to get baklava, or a way to shopping, but I didn't know exactly. Uh, and, and it wasn't really like that I had this plan uh, it was a personal quest. The trees had become important to me, and I didn't really know why, but I knew that if I could find them, that, that, that you know, it was going to reveal something. And this is the true, honest story. I wrote a grant, and I said exactly that, that I did not have an outcome planned, that in fact it was a totally personal quest, and I, I wasn't going there to find these trees to do X. And I got funded, so I went back to Turkey, and I, I spent three weeks in search of my trees. When I came back to the United States, um, Rachel Adams, who was then the curator at the UB Art Gallery, learned about this project and invited me to be part of her exhibition called Wanderlust. Uh, I had to tell her, unfortunately, it wasn't a project. Um, she very nicely said, you have almost two years to make it one. Uh, so I did. I went to, I got a residency at Visual Studies Workshop in uh, Rochester, and, and I made it into a project. So there were 16 trees, and I think about the trees as individual stories, and so each one is in this turquoise block, and there is the tree as I knew it in 2010, and the landmarks that led me back to the tree because I didn't know the coordinates. I didn't know exactly where it was. But in my photo library and in my journal, I would have images that would be like, okay, yeah, this is, this is the wall that's near depot, and I know that this tree was somewhere near depot. It's an art center near depot. So I'm going to take this picture and make this little travel log and see if it helps me get there. Uh, and then I would photograph the tree as I found it uh, in 2015. 
or I didn't find it, which would sometimes be the case. But the wonderful thing about the project is it required, it required lots of people helping me. Uh, friends, um, you know, in the evening arguing, no, 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 that's on the way to Asher's house. No, that's where the police station used to be before they built the new one. And so we would go to all these different places. But also, I would ask strangers, because I had made this notebook with, with my images uh, that were my clues. And so I would show it to somebody. And sometimes I would get really lucky, and I would show it to someone, and with great um, pride, they would take me to the tree. With a great sense of ownership, they would take me to the tree. So it was really, it was quite lovely, and I, I, in, in retrospect, I wish only that I had a sense of what the um, interaction was going to be with the stranger on the street, and, and even with, with my friends in Istanbul, because I think that that w um, would have led to um, something more for me while, while I was in the process. But it did lead for something more that, again, was not planned uh, once I was back. So the only thing I returned with besides photographs uh, was this journal. And this journal was quite large. I took an uh, uh, 18 by 24 uh, pad of vellum with me, trace, because the Istanbul street map is so large. And every night I would hand draw the little map where I had gone. And um, you can see like from my apartment, and then here I'm going across the Halic, and then I would make the tree when I find it. And then I found myself writing in the space of the Bosphorus because it was the only empty space. Uh, so this journal existed at Visual Studies Workshop. The only things I took with me to work on the project were related to, to finding the trees in Istanbul. And this is really critical because when you're trying to just focus on one thing, the beauty was leaving my studio, the chaos of my studio, and going to this place where all I had with me was information related to, to this project. So that, that's all I was thinking about. And I have to give Tate Shaw, the former director of Visual Studies Workshop, an enormous amount of credit. He read this journal uh, all, the, from beginning to end. And then he saw the exhibition, Wanderlust, and he said to me, the narrative is too important. The narrative is really the key to this project. And so I made a book uh, with Visual Studies Workshop called Do You Know This Tree? And it's a very different experience because it brings together each chapter, its own kind of short story, as a narrative of both process um, but also of place. Um, and people of place. And there's characters, because friends show up in this tree and then in that tree. And, and it really threads together much better the sense of seeking out the trees, but also it threads together the city of Istanbul, uh, much better than the still images did on the wall. So in the end, it was, it was a far more significant project um, to, to bring it to fruition as a book. But here's the thing, when I began, when I returned to Istanbul, I, th there wasn't a plan. And then over time, it turned into a photo documentation and into uh, a published book. So it, it, it's, it's, giving, it's letting things work out, right? Like we work and, and something works out or it doesn't. But if it doesn't work out, that's also OK. Because you're not going to get to that next point unless you had done what you, what you just previously did. And you really have to develop a sense of trust in your own studio practice to, to really believe that. Because otherwise, as I said earlier, we're just rushing to make the work. For what? And that, that's really, you know, I, I can't, can't stress that enough, like to just slow down in your process of thinking about where work can go. And when something doesn't come to fruition, leaving it and, and coming back to it or not. 
the project I'm working on right now is um, uh, reading poems, 26 Walks in Malmo, Sweden. And I uh, returned from Malmo a month ago. I was there for six weeks as, as part of a, a research team working um, in, in the city on urban passageway. And I had a project that was you know, part of the, um, the research team. And then I also developed my own project, which is this reading poems. And it literally was um, walking every day without a predetermined path. Just the idea of a destination, but not how I would get there. That the navigation would be through encounters. The navigation would be, what is it that I see from the corner of my eye that interests me? And I'll just turn that way. But I do know where I'm kind of headed. And that might take me three hours or six hours. But that's OK. Um, and, and the project is in, in a state of becoming. It's not, not finished yet. And it's not going uh, in the way that I had planned it when I began it. And that, that's good for me. I like that. that once I'm on the ground, things change. And then once I have all, all of what I have completed during a project, you know, things change again as you start to synthesize it. Um, so I, I'm kind of um, working through where these maps are going to go. But what has happened is that on one side, you can see that's one day's walk. And the red dot is my apartment block, where I had rented an apartment in Malmo. And what, what was really important is that the starting point is always the same. So in 26 days, when you have the stack on the other side, you only see the red dot once. But what you see underneath that is this network of lines right? that just filter out through the city. And they represent all the different walks. And many times you cross over the same street again, so you might find lines that, when you're peering through this trace paper, um, that cross over each other. But I wanted to create this sense of this network. And so the, the stack of 26 pages sits on a light table, so it's reflected through. Um, but I. I was like, each one of these walks is separate. And it was its own kind of exercise in moving through the city. So I had this real desire to see, where have I been in Malmo? So this is my Malmo map. Here are, this is all the streets that I walked on. And it's not about distance, because many streets, as I say, I walked on more than once. And lots of intersections I went through hundreds of times. But it's about putting the pieces of the city together to create this whole. So this is, this is, you know, there's a lot of race here that I didn't walk on in Malmo. But this is every street that I did walk on in Malmo. And something else that came out of this project, because early on I thought it was going to be about the line and the image, back to the Salzburg piece, um, a borrowed view, uh, just opposed with each other. And then I realized that, that the images uh, have formed my lexicon of, um, of Malmo, my vocabulary of Malmo. And every day, I, I took a photograph of something that would capture my attention just long enough to, to take a photograph of it. But my interest in it is because it's associated to something that I'm thinking about. It's associated to some of those ideas that I'm walking around with that come from the studio. So the beauty is that I now have decontextualized from Mamo, from walking, this image base. And that's really how I managed to kind of go full circle and bring making sculpture and working on drawings and working in the public realm and going out and walking and all of it coming back inside the studio. Thank you.
Do you want to put an image back up? Sure. We can put I can do it one minute. Yeah. Sure. You can put up any image you like. Is there questions? It's okay. You don't have to have a question. Allie, what was the question again? Sorry. Um, so your one project is the yellow chain link fence, and then the tree was blue, and you've got blue in other places, like your book with the blue pages. Is there significance to that color blue for you? She's asking if blue is significant to you. Blue? Blue. Um, blue is significant in the, in the, the Momo map. But otherwise, I wouldn't say that blue as a color is, is necessarily significant. So is there a piece in particular? In the Mamo map, there, there is a reason for the blue, which just has to do with the fact that I was there when the sun didn't set, so I was always with the blue sky. And Mamo is a peninsula surrounded by the Baltic and the North Sea. So it was the, the, the blueness seemed like the appropriate color. But I think that you have a different sense of the blue in color. Um, what about the yellow chain link fence house with the blue tree? The blue tree and the yellow house have to do with thinking very, I, you know, this, I may have said this or maybe not, but I, I would consider myself a formalist in, in terms of decisions that I make in composition. And the blue um, against the, Meadow uh, was enough of a focal point without being an anomaly. Like if it had been pink or orange, it would have just you know been this. But the blue st stands out against the meadow, um, but but yet it, it wasn't um, in it, the intensity of of some of my color choices. So it was really a formal decision about how, and the yellow was much more thinking of the chain link. The powder coating on that was much more a consideration for how the yellow and green kind of camouflage together so that the house um, is, is somewhat invisible. I mean, both because it's chain link, which we, you know, look through, you know, it's this, this wall that you kind of pass through. Um, but the color, again, is, is kind of blending in with the landscape where <clears throat> the blue tree stands out but doesn't scream. So it was a really conscious, kind of formal, compositional decision with the tree. I, I, I'm just, I have to interrupt for one second. There's going to be an interpreter because I, I'm deaf. I wear a cochlear processor, and in this distance, I can't. See, read your lips, and I can't hear that far away. So my friend in the front here is a, a good interpreter. Um, have you returned to any of the trees since 2015, or has the fence been? Did you go back to the trees in 2015? What in Istanbul? Uh, like after 2015. Um, I I have been back to Istanbul since. I have not been back to all of those trees. Some of them, yes, because they are clearly like the one that I, <coughs> I mentioned, Depo, is an art center that, that I would go to. So I, that tree is there, just the way, same, same way. And, and the um, pomegranate tree that was run over, yeah, that, that tree is doing great, except the, the structure around it gets bigger and bigger every time I see it, though the tree is doing very well. So I'm not sure why they keep building this barricade. Um, but I only see the ones that are clearly on the path to some place where I'm going, and I don't go out of my way to find the others. But that's a very good question. Yeah. I have a question. OK. I noticed that your public works uh, all are porous. There's no solidity. <coughs> Everything is open to the vista around. How important is that? I mean, that seems really significant in your choice. Uh, it is. 
Um, I think that, that um, did everybody hear that? It's about, the, 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 it's, it's quite, because it's quite different than if you look at the interior sculptures, which are a, a mass. You know, even if they're small, they're a mass. Um, and outside, I'm not, it, yeah, it's about, it, it's back to the chain link, where you can see through it. So instead of being this thing that is placed on the landscape, it kind of filters out and embraces the landscape as, as we visually pierce it. So yes, yeah. <coughs> Mm -hmm. Can you say the last? Like, how do you define balance, and how does that affect your final composition with your other Balance? Yeah, how yeah. do you define okay. balance? Okay, ba ba balance is a, how do I define ba visual balance is really hard. And you're very fortunate that you never had to take my 3D design class and do a visual balance project. Because, you know, it, it, it's, it's hard. How do we really decide that? What, what is something that's balanced? Um, but, but in saying that, Right? In the same sense as something being visually balanced, that visual balance could also be askew. Like not physically, because it's got to exist in space, right? It's got to stand up. But the visual balance could be like, whoa, off, you know, kind of off our sense of what, what would be um, a symmetrical form of balance. Uh, working with a lot of different materials, I think that one of the things that, that guides me in compositionally is how the transition is made from one part of a form to another, which is often merging from one sense of materiality into another. Um, I would say that was a few days of reading, uh, and, um, and I, I read each and every one of them because I had thought that there was funding to produce a book from them, and then the funding was pulled. And so I really did sit down and read each one of those stories, trying to determine how we could select, I think the, the limit was going to be 50 of them into, into a book. Uh, and so I did read them. I still have them, but I'm not sure what's going to become of them. But it's back to one of those things where it's unfinished, and so who knows, it might still turn around and become something. You know, the thing I want to say about the participatory projects that I've been doing, and I feel really fortunate because sometimes when I start out on them, I think I'm a little bit like, well, oh, this is nuts. Um, but what I have discovered in the, in the temporary participatory projects that I have done is when you invite the public, you, you receive the gift of willingness. I think what really happens all too often is there's not the invitation. And when there is the invitation, you, you will get that gift of the return. Um, so far, I've been quite fortunate anyways with that. So thank you. Can you, I have one more question on that, though. All right, then you can end it. Just talking maybe <laughs> culturally, the difference between, you know, you were in Turkey working, and then you're in Sweden. Just working with these different communities, and then in the U.S., are there certain things that you saw that were really distinctive between them? Um, you kind of like somewhat of a. It is yes. It, it, this liaison. I I the honestly the project when I was invited to go to the European Night of the Museums, <coughs> I understood why they selected the project because to make the tower human, you know, put the flowers on it, sounds good, right? 
I really, I was like, we're not going anywhere here. And people came from all over the city of Kaliningrad. All of those flowers were gone in, in a couple of hours. In fact, they were gone so quickly that one of the museum guards uh, is a mountain climber. That's only relative because the high-low that had put the flowers up on the tower was long gone. And so he actually scaled the tower, and we took all the flowers off of the tower and gave them away that night because there were so many people coming for them. Um, I had been to uh, the Soviet Union and to Russia before going to Kaliningrad. So I had a sense of the Russian people, um, and I did not expect a, um, I will not use the term friendliness, because I think there was th this sense of you know, kind of uncertainty with, with somebody from European, though I'm not, but th that was the sense. Uh, but this sense of, of curiosity and sharing. And the sharing part, I want to say, was, yeah, you take the flower, you don't have to share anything. But so many of the people responded with documentation that that was really surprising. Turkey would never surprise me. It's the friendliest country on planet Earth, and I have traveled a lot. Uh, the Turks are extremely friendly. Um, extremely generous, and, and so I, my, my sense that the project there um, being successful, uh, was I didn't have any questions about it. And I, I thought that, you know, I met the, the young girl smiling at the tea shop, you know, that really kind of sums it up. That, that would be uh, uh, the way that I would say about Turkey. In Sweden, um, much more reserved much more reserved, and uh, there was um, I didn't do a participatory um, public project. Uh, my walking, you know, my, was my own project, but uh, what I was there doing with the design team, the research team, was working on um, participatory uh, cartography workshops. And so I worked with a number of community groups throughout the city. Uh, and you know, a sense of politeness and, and rendering action. I mean, you got what it was you were asking people to do, uh, but there wasn't like an openness and dialogue. It was, was quite different. Um, I guess I have to confess the only participatory project I've ever done in the United States is the tree <laughs> in Westport. Um, I, I have never, I mean, the majority, uh, I have many other participatory projects that I've done around the world that I didn't show tonight, but the only time I've ever uh, done a um, public participatory project in the U.S. has been the project at Westport. Uh, and I went into it very apprehensive um, because I hadn't done one in the United States and really just <coughs> like, you know, I, you know, we're not always that friendly. Um, oh, you know what? Oh, we're not always that engaged. That, that the fr everybody's friendly, but we're not th always that engaged. Um, and then also, as I said, we were just coming out of the pandemic, so where was that going to take us? But it turned out to be people wanted to share. Th there was, th I mean, the stories are really lovely. Uh, and, and it, you know, and it took no time. I would sit. Uh, uh, on, a, on one of these, a big rock, and, and just watch people go to the box, take it out, and I had stamped the first couple of words, I remember a tree, and then they just write, like it just came. It wasn't like this forced um, process at all. Well, thank you so much. Robert. Thank you.